got so much going on today. I had to cut my sermon way back. It's only two hours today, so you feel really <laughs> Our scripture today is on uh, leadership and service. It's Mark chapter 9, verses 33 to 37. And we'll also uh, read verse 42 as well. It's we pull out the Pew Bible, or I got it here on the screen. This is after Jesus has been transfigured on the mountain at the beginning of the chapter and then wrestled with an unclean spirit and then he begins uh, uh, revealing what his full mission is about. Let's pray as we prepare to hear his word. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds to this word that the truth of it may sink in and touch our hearts and we can become the people you truly want us to be as followers of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And they came to Capernaum, or Capernaum, oops, excuse me, that's the second paragraph. They went from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Capernaum's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee where they carried out much of his ministry, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Jesus is doing the old face palm thing here. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put, them, put the child in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. And skipping down a little further, uh, he picks up on the same kind of theme in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The theme of Mark's gospel is redemptive service to others. It's summed up in particular in Mark 10, 45, where Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Mark's gospel in one line. It's what Jesus came to do, and it's the redemptive work that he wants all of his followers, you and me, to engage in today, now 2,000 years later, to serve the needs of others and reach out to them. Now, in Mark's gospel, this is underscored in three passages, or three chapters, but run back to back, and they have the same pattern in the scripture. And the pattern is first, Jesus gives a prediction about his passion. The Son of Man's going to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest him, uh, betray him, crucify him, and three days later, he will rise again to life. This wasn't a surprise to Jesus. What happened to him in Jerusalem, he knew was part of God's plan. But his disciples don't know what's going on when he says this, so they always misunderstand it. So Jesus has to turn around and correct it. In Mark 8, 27 to 38 is when uh, Peter uh, hears Jesus saying he's got to go and uh, be crucified. Peter wants to rebuke Jesus. No, none of this. You're the son of God. You can't do this. And Jesus has to turn around and rebuke Peter and say, Satan, get behind me. You're not on the side of God, but the side of men. And then he goes on to say, uh, if you're going to, whoever wants to be my disciple must first deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You cannot save your life in this world uh, or you will lose it. You have to lose your life here in order to save it in God's great kingdom. Similarly, the chapter after ours today, chapter 10, uh, Jesus gives the passion prediction. James and John come up to him after that and say, hey, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. We want the chief seats when you come in your kingdom, to sit at your right and your left. Of course, Jesus is going to the old face palm there once again. What are these guys doing? I've been with them for years, and they're still asking dumb stuff like this. 
And Jesus says, no, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The greatest is going to be the servant of others. You're not going to be like the pagan overlords. You're going to be one of my people who serves the needs. And then we come to our passage today, where the uh, disciples hear Jesus' passion prediction, and they argue over which one of them is the greatest. I've been, I know Jesus longer. I've been closer to Jesus. I've done more about what Jesus wants. And Jesus said, no, that's not how it's going to go. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Of course, Jesus demonstrated that in a, uh, at the Last Supper when he washed feet, when he was the guest of honor there. Uh, and so that uh, picture is uh, our verse today, but the image from uh, the Last Supper where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And hey, the point here is no one is too low to not merit attention from Jesus' people. And he used a child as an example. He took a child up in his arms and he blessed him and said, you got to do this. These are the people you need to serve. And of course, in that day and time, children uh, uh, were at the lowest of the low. They're down there with the slaves. You just push them out in the street. You don't bother with them uh, or give them uh, much thought. And Jesus says, no. Uh, they, they are not as useless as the powerful people say, but Jesus' people, and especially the leaders, must serve others, and they start by serving the children. That's the point of this passage, and we learn that today. And uh, this mandate applies to every church, every leader, every parent, every officer, and to every member. Christians and Presbyterians have really taken this to heart, Want, always want to make sure they take care of the children. They always have. That's why Presbyterians baptize kids. We want to mark them as belonging to Jesus from the very earliest moment of their life. Doesn't mean Ronan's a, a believing, born again uh, Christian at this point, but it sets him and seals him on that right path that he will walk all the rest of his life. There he goes over there. Hi, Ronan. We're saying all this about you today. We also protect them from a world that will eliminate them or exploit them like King Herod did. You know, he thought, oh, let's go raid a village and wipe out 20 kids and maybe get Jesus with them. That was the way they thought of children back then. Life was cheap. We don't do that. We stand up for life at all stages. We watch politics today and some of us are horrified by what we're seeing. People celebrating, being able to terminate a baby the day before his due date or her due date. And we go, ow. Ah. That's not what God wants. So we try to move away from that and stand up for life and righteousness. And then ultimately, we want to lead them to Jesus. We want them to have that personal relationship with them that brings them from death to life, from brokenness to wholeness, uh, uh, from uh, sadness and despair and into joy. Uh, the peace that passes understanding and the benefits of God's kingdom. And the church won't succeed without ministering to children and the families that come with them. Uh, the only possible exception is if you live in some age-restricted retirement community. But that's not our environment here. So a chief point of this church's work is to reach out to families with children and youth and nurture those young people and bring them along so they have that saving relationship with Jesus. And there are lots of pictures there of Jesus with the children. Uh, and uh, we sing Jesus loves the little children. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So I said that before our officers who are going to be ordained and installed here uh, this morning, that that's a key component of what we need to be doing together. Uh, the whole church uh, is working together to raise these children and bring them to saving faith. So this is what we put into practice today when we baptized Ronan and made vows together. Now this yellow sheet has a lot of vows on it. Uh, and these are all very important. Now, the baptismal vows are the second most important vows in Christian today. <coughs> What's the most important? Not, I'm not talking about general faith in Jesus here, but commitments we make to one another as Christians. First one is your marriage vows. That eternal pledge you make to your spouse uh, to forsake all others and uh, uh, to serve them alone. As I said to Gina, I might take thee, Gina, to be my wedded wife and do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be thy loving and faithful husband, plenty in want, joy and sorrow, and sickness and in health. 
That's legally binding as well as spiritually binding. So that's recognized in this world as well as the next. And so that's our most important one. Baptism is second to that. Baptism comes along, and this is where we all undertake the full nurture and spiritual responsibility for children of our own and of our fellow church members. There's no bigger responsibility than we can assume other than our marriage vows. Third most important, which we'll see in a little while, is the ordination of elders, where they make a commitment to the Lord that they are being called and set apart to service in God's kingdom in a new and special way. And uh, so uh, that one's a big one. And then fourth is just your general membership vows. Those are solemn obligations too. And just because it's fourth on the list doesn't mean they aren't important. We stand in front of a church family and profess faith in Jesus and promise to serve and to, uh, be active to the best of our ability. This is an awesome commitment we make to the Lord and he expects us to hold up, hold up our end of that. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. That means we're going to go through some bad times and when it's harder uh, to do, but uh, it means by and large that's what our uh, understanding of the Christian life is about. So we're going to do three of these four today. Now if anybody has a marriage license out there and wants to get married, we can fill the whole thing today and do all four of them all at once. All the vows that Christians can make. Any takers? Okay, none of those today. we got plenty of others to deal with. So but this is what we're doing today. And all this is central to the life of the church. And everything focuses on babies like Ronan and the other kids here. And that means just infants, uh, elementary, uh, middle school, teenagers, college. We want to continue to nurture them through all these different challenges. You know, they say that 80% of all commitments to Jesus Christ are made by the time a person is 18 in life. Once people reach adulthood, they get set in and more resistant to the gospel if they haven't come to Jesus uh, before that time. So it's important that we do this work up front. And uh, so uh, that's what we work on here at Flat Ranch. This is why Jesus even goes on to underscore how serious this is. You notice that last verse we read. This is the one time Jesus argues for capital punishment in the New Testament. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. I mean, Jesus, I thought Jesus was all love and acceptance and didn't put any hard standards on anybody. Is Jesus being soft here at all? No, this is utmost seriousness to Jesus. Our little children are precious to us, and we cannot cause any of them to sin. So when we see the horrendous things in the news that are happening to kids these days and uh, stuff, uh, we say, no, we can't go there. We've got to stand with Jesus and resist the ways of the world. Now today, our elders will follow up on all this and will take vows to serve the children and the whole congregation so everyone here will grow in uh, their faith. And so that's what we're here to conclude our service with today. And there are several things, three things I want to tell you that you can do to help them. First of all, pray for them that they have a vision and a sense of calling from God that God wants us to do big things for this community and for the world and that they will have the courage to put that calling into play. This is what the church needs, not just here at Flat Ranch in Harney County, but across the world. Culture has gone very resistant to the gospel these days, so we need elders and uh, other leaders who will stand up for biblical truth and uh, uh, preserve God's uh, path of righteousness. So that's the first thing. Pray for them. Encourage them. Lift them up that they might have true vision and courage. Next is follow them and help them. Serve with the servants. They're called to be servant leaders, so you need to go, and if they're stepping up and doing the right thing, you need to jump in. The question isn't so much, uh, uh, somebody else needs to do something, but if you see something out there that needs to be taken care of, please do. Uh, one thing, uh, I got a little bonus from a church member this week. Uh, last week, the, the new computer projection system kept uh, shutting out because the plug down here has been so old, this is probably an original 1965 plug, the computer cord 
uh, kept falling out of it, and so it would switch back to battery back and forth, which shuts the projection system down. Somebody stepped in, has already addressed that. That's good servant leadership. We appreciate that. Three, hold them accountable to biblical goals and standards. We all work together, they're supposed to lead, but we need to encourage them to lead and to uh, stand up for God's truth and the call of Jesus into the mission field. So, uh, just as I'm accountable, our elders are accountable, and we as members and fellow Christians are accountable to one another uh, to build each other up and call each other to our highest and best. So this is where we are today. We're trying to build a magnetic church in 2019 and beyond. So God has primed us, I believe, with all these things for a really great year. New members, new life, and you may be here today, new leaders, and new joy. So we just need a few things to make this all happen. One, as I've already just mentioned, the visionary leadership from our leaders. Who are we trying to reach? And what is the best way to do it? What is God calling us to do and be as a congregation? Second thing is energetic service by our members on a regular basis. It's the old-fashioned word commitment. We're going to be committed to Jesus and a particular congregation. We need to step, and do our, step up and do our part. And that leads to the third thing, which is sharing of the resources necessary to propel the church forward. We got into trouble last year uh, with our finances and other things, and so we'll talk about that next week to encourage everybody to step up and do their best. Are you ready to do your part? We have new leaders who are about to step up to do their part. You'll get a nice little ceremony here in a minute. You can join them in serving the children, the adults, the teenagers, and our community. We give it all to Jesus. He will give us his blessings and his love and his bounty in return. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, prepare us now for this great step of faith uh, that we can all take with these new officers that are about to be uh, ordained and installed. Touch and call them and lead them forward and lead us with them. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. So we're going to just jump right from this into our ordination of our officers. I want to invite our newly elected officers. Uh, uh, hopefully they're all here today. Uh, they may be missing one. Uh, uh, Alvin McCartan, Ray McCartan, Carolyn Shaw, Betty Bain, Holt Feldman, Ken Hutchinson, and Aja Wilson. I want y'all to come forward right now.